word. Remembering after this service, this afternoon, you'll probably go back to your churches for the night service. I'll try to let out early so you can do so. Listen, if I was in this city around, I'd tend to these, these churches. There, I really would. I'm not saying it's never told me to say this. There's some fine men, real brothers. And then each one of you that accepted Christ, if they didn't get your name, why don't you look them up for Christian baptism and let them lead you on to the baptism of the Holy Ghost? If you don't have a church, you must it, see you'll die spiritually. You'll just dwindle away. If you don't have a church, why don't you go and talk to them? They'd be glad to help you. They're, they're, they're brothers in Christ, and they, they'd be glad to help you. Isn't that right, brother? Just very happy to help you. And help you along. Do anything that they can for you. Good, faithful man. Someone who will watch over your soul and care for you. Do that. And if you accepted Christ and they didn't get your name, just somewhere in the seat, you just accepted him. Why don't you go talk to him about baptism now and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do that now. God bless you. We want to read this, this afternoon out of the book of Philippians, the second chapter of Philippians. And I want to begin with the fifth verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things that are in heaven and things in earth, things underneath the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Christ the Lord to the glory of God our Father. Let us bow our heads for a moment. Our Lord, we are approaching thee now in the holy name that, that's got heaven's name. And all the family in the earth is named. And he told us when here you ask the Father anything in my name, I will grant it. We just simple people, Lord, but we believe that to be the truth. We believe that what we ask we receive. Because if our if our souls condemn us not, if we don't have any bad feelings of what we've done that's wrong, then we have this assurance that God will hear us. So we are asking for mercy uh, this afternoon for all of us. Amen. And then I'm asking that you will grant to this waiting audience now the healing of every person that's in divine presence. May this be one of the greatest healing services that we have ever had. May there be something take place, Lord. We don't know how it would happen or what else could be done, but we pray that the Holy Spirit will have the preeminence this afternoon to break into every heart and to every mind. As we have just read, let the mind that was in Christ be in you. I pray, God, that as we see that the mind is the controlling power of the whole being, that it directs us, and let the mind that was in Christ being us this afternoon, and he was always believing the Word. Amen. And now may there be a great outpouring of his presence upon us. And I pray for these ministers, Lord, that's cooperated in this meeting that each of their church will be benefited with such great spiritual and material benefits because of their stand to try to bring to their people 
the gospel in every true fashion that they know it's being preached in. And I pray, Father, that you will bless them. And may the people appreciate them, Amen. knowing that, that they're doing it for their sake and for the gospel's sake. That may they in return help and put their shoulders to the wheel to push for the cause that we're trying to bring forth on the earth the Lord Jesus. Now, Father, we pray that you'll take the words as we have read them, and you are your own interpreter, so we pray that you'll interpret it to our hearts today. And when we leave today, may we say like those coming from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Bless them, God, all these newborn babes that just come to you. I pray in their tender little way that they'll be fed with the censer milk of the gospel, that they'll grow into great statues of Christ, that they might be his mouthpieces and servants to serve him in this great shadowing age that we're now living in the evening lights. Grant it, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. people from the east to the west, from the north to the south, to take up the cross and follow thou me, for I'm Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of Israel. I'm calling my people out of darkness uh, to walk in the light of the Lord. Uh, Jesus is the light, uh, and walk ye in the light of Jesus as you have time and opportunity, because the time is now drawing nigh at hand. Uh, oh, we have eaten the noonday meal, uh, and it's almost supper time, uh, and it's time to eat the last meal at the marriage supper of the Lamb. God is moving in all of the earth. He's warning his people to look for him and to watch and to be ready for his return back to earth again because he is the savior of the world. He is the healer of every nation. He is the healer of every kindred and tongue and nationality and he is the one and beside him there is none other, thou saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. I think the message would be to comfort the saints and to exalt, exhort the young converts to come closer to God and to continue in the faith. Thanks be to God. Now, I want to take this subject for a while. We got, won't be able to speak for just a, a little while because we got around 500 prayer cards out, and they've all got to be prayed for. So now I'm doing this so that it might help. I'm wondering if my voice hasn't got a rebound. Can you hear me way back in the back all right? It just sounds to me like it's bouncing back here. And last night in making the altar call, I thought that that's maybe the reason people couldn't understand that it's had a rebound. Now, I want to take this subject this afternoon, identification. Now, uh, anyone that must be, we're living in a days when identification is required. You can't, unless you're known at a bank, you can't uh, cash your check unless you have something to identify yourself. I know my wife, she can't cash a check, yet uh, when we get our check, we put it in the bank, but she don't cash it because she doesn't drive, she has no social security number or nothing to identify herself, so therefore it's a hard thing for her to cash a check. You've got to be a, some official identification, and I think it's just that time that we're living in. If you notice. If you go to a certain denomination of church, like a Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, or something, 
you have to have something to identify yourself if you go to speak. You have to have a credential or a card or a fellowship card or something to identify yourself as where they know where you come from and what you're going to say at that platform. You have to be identified. And, um, and it's identifying age. Now, all that it happens in the natural is only a type that's going on in the spiritual. We also, the Christian church itself, which is of no denomination but of a nature, it is the mystical body of Christ. And it's identified also. It bears identification. Jesus identified himself. And now we're going to speak this afternoon upon identification in the Bible character. We're going to our, identify our present condition in, with characters of the Bible of other ages. Now, we wonder sometimes what, uh, what we would look like if we would try to look into the mirror and see what we look like. It reminds me of a little story I heard one time of a family that lived way back in Kentucky, where I come from, way back in the mountain country, where there's, well, my grandmother lived to be 110 years old, and she never seen but one automobile, and to bring it from an old grade up to where I brought mine up, it taken almost eight hours to go about four miles, putting logs in the creek and things to get it across. She never seen a, a, a train or anything old enough when she died years ago. She remembered the assassination of President Lincoln and lived to be 110 years old. And I guess she never had three or four pair of shoes all of her life. And I can just see the little old tracks now, like a little coon track going up to the spring of a morning before daylight with a big old cedar bucket with hoops, brass hooks on it to get water, come down to do her cooking. Set with her little feet out before an old fireplace like that, big cracks and them bleeding in there. But when she died, she put her arms around me. I held her in my arms and cried, praying for her like this. The last words I heard her say was, God bless your little soul now and forevermore. I was just a boy then. But she knew Christ as her Savior. But they didn't have very much of the world's good. So out of this story comes this, that these uh, people never could afford a looking glass. They didn't have one. And the father had just a piece of a, a mirror he tacked on the tree to shave by on the outside. They had a little boy, and he had this little piece of mirror, while well, he had never been able to, to get up to where it was at to see himself. So he come to visit in the city with... Uh, one of his uh, mother's sisters who had married a, a man that had come to Indiana. And then they lived out there. So uh, they had a home that the old-fashioned home used to be. They had a full mirror on the door sometime when he would go in, in, in the bedrooms. I don't know where any of you remember them old doors or not. It had a full-length mirror up and down the door. So the little boy, he got to his auntie's house, and he was running around like any little boy would, and, and they noticed him. He, he started uh, to walk up the steps. And as he did at the head of the steps, when he's getting close to the head of the steps, he began to see another little boy appearing. And he stopped and looked at the little boy. Of course, it was, he waved at him, and he waved back at him, and he kept getting closer and closer watching the little fella. First thing, he reached out his hand, he looked around, and his parents was watching him because he'd never seen a mare before. He said, well, that's me. So I just wonder today if we could look in the Bible and say, that's me, as we wonder. Which one is it? Um, which character in the Bible would we look like? And let's just take that for a little text out and stay with it for a while. And as we look into God's Word, Let's identify ourselves, for he give others in there for examples of what we are. Now remember that God takes his spirit, or takes his man, but never his spirit. Satan takes his man, but never his spirit. So let's see if we can identify our present state now with Bible characters. Now 
They, the Bible said all those things happened back in those days for examples for us. They are our examples. Our character molds us to the image of what we are, our character of life that's in us. Now, you take a little germ of life, and when, if, it's a, if it's a germ of a, of a bird, it'll produce a bird. And if it's a germ of a, of a wheat, it'll produce wheat. The germ of corn, it'll produce corn. See, the life that's in it molds the character of it. Then we'd find the same thing like a life of a cancer. See, a germ, cancer germ. It molds a cancer. It's an evil life. A uh, life of a tumor would mold a tumor. So forth. You see, we our characters is molded by what's on the inside of us. And our outside only expresses what's on the inside. What we are, how we walk, no matter what we say, our life speaks louder than our words does. If we might say, I am a believer in God, and I'd say, well, do you believe all the Bible? Well, I don't know. Then you see, your, your, your lips, your very... If your life is speaking louder then than what your words would be. If you say, I am a Christian, I do not believe in doing, and I believe all that God said is true, then live any kind of a life after that. See, your, your life speaks louder than what your testimony does. And you know, that's one of the greatest hindrance that the church of God has. It, the bootlegger, the gambler, the, them people are... We, we all know which way they're headed, and they know themselves. But the fellow that professes to be a Christian, the woman that professes to be a Christian, and then lives something different, it's the greatest stumbling block that the outside world has got, uh, uh, that there is in the outside world. Any worse, worse than anything the world can produce is a person that's supposed to be a Christian and then lives something else different from that. Lying, stealing, cheating. And doing things that he ought not to do, it's a discredit to his testimony. When you take people that do those things there, and they are, they are our character is molded uh, in there by the life that is in us. Now we say uh, Jesus came to save that which was lost. That's what he did. And now there had to be something to save this lost, so it had to be a different character than that which was lost. So we find then, when God looked down upon this creation of his that he had made uh, upon the, his, his, the characters of this earth, his loving character, his self, was molded into the person of Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world. He, this was done so he could pay the penalty for death for us and redeem us. It certainly fulfilled John 3, 16, see, that God, no other person could do it. Jesus could have been no one else. There was no other character anywhere could have produced such a person as Jesus Christ but God himself. Now, there was nothing in the heaven that could have done it. You know, John looked in the, the book there, the Bible, we find that he saw uh, there was no one upon the earth that was worthy to take the book, the book of redemption. And there was nobody in heaven worthy, nobody that was beneath the earth, or nowhere was able or worthy to take the book, to loose the seals, or to even look on it. And he wept because in this book was the book of redemption. His own name was in there, and nobody was worthy. And then... One of the elders said, Fear not, for the line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and he's worthy. John looked then to see a, a lion, and he saw a lamb. And it must have been a slaying lamb. It was a bloody lamb. He said it was uh, full of blood because it was a lamb that had been slain. And a slaying lamb is bloody, of course. And it had been slain from the foundation of the world. He came and took the book. There was nobody else could do it, because if you plant any, like a cucklebur in the ground, any of you Arkansas know what a cucklebur is, and put that in the ground, you can't expect to harvest a crop of corn out of it. No, you can't. 
So if you took a cockleburr and put it with a, and crossed it up with a jimson weed, you still wouldn't have nothing. See? And uh, see, there's no character in there but what would produce the same character, evil to evil. So if taken something that was not evil, that could produce a character like Jesus Christ, and it was God looking upon his creation and his own loving character, seeing that lost yet in his image made for his glory, and see that lost, his own love projected Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That was God manifesting himself, not some other person but himself, in a body form to redeem what had been lost. I wonder how sad that must have been when God looked upon the earth and it grieved him that he ever made man. One time I, I had my little girl over the hand and we was up in Cincinnati at the zoo and we were going down along watching the animals and I heard a great noise down below the, the, the cages where the, the animals such as wolves and tigers and so forth were. I walked down there and there's a huge big cage all as high as the ceiling perhaps and they just got an eagle a little Oh, a few weeks before that, out of uh, and put him in captivity. I never felt so sorry for that poor fellow. And he would get back. He's a big bird, and here he was, all caged up by some something that man had done. It trapped him into something and put him in a cage. And that big fellow, he was bleeding over the head. His great bald eagle, that big white head, and and his wings, all the feathers is beat off of him like that. And the poor old fellow's laying on his back, his eyes weary, looking around. He'd get up, walk back over to the other side of the cage, and look up towards the heavens. That's where he come from. He's a heavenly bird. There's nothing can follow him. A hawk could disintegrate to try to follow him. Nothing can follow that eagle. And he goes so high. His eyes is comparative with his height. He can see what he's doing when he's up there. What good does you get up there if you don't know what you're doing? So God likened his prophets to eagles that foresees things before they happen. Now notice him bleeding. He'd lay on his back and look up like that. That's where he belonged. But man had caged him. I thought, what a pitiful sight. He'd get back and he'd fly, flop those big wings and just butt his head against those bars and fall back in the floor again, lay there weary and look around like that. Looking at heavens where he was free up there at one time and now in a cage. I stood there and cried. I wish they had sold me the thing. I'd turn him loose. They'll see anything caged up. Now, if that would make a man who loves outdoors, as I love outdoors, if that would make a man cry to look at that, and that was a pitiful sight, but oh, let me give you a more pitiful sight is to see men and women who were made in the image of God to bear his character, yet housed into things and housed in by the traps of the world. See a beautiful young lady coming down the street, such a, a, a real, uh, her, her, such a pretty woman and her pretty hair all cut off. See her face with with uh, a pretty shaped face with so much paint on it, she can't tell what she looks like. Looks like she's cankered with blue under her eyes and, and eyes like a lizard or a wolf or something like that. And to see her with clothes on it, she shouldn't be even caught into the, the bedroom herself with the doors locked with them on. And out on the street displaying herself like that and to see sons of God, which ought to recognize that to be their sister out on the street whistling and trying to pick her up to take her out for bad purposes. That's a pitiful sight to see that Satan has caged in the human race. There's nothing could save it but a character that could come over the top of all of that. That, that there was nothing in it and that had to come from that pure fountain of Almighty God. That pretty little lady who could be a, a real little queen to some little tired preacher come in and take him up on her laps and put her arms around him and, 
and quiet him down. There's nothing will take that place. And that's part of a man. There's no hand can touch you when you're tired, wore out, but a real kind, gentle wife who understands. Man knows that. And to see her out like that, she's in a cage that Hollywood has put her in. And many times them women claim to be Christians and sing in choirs, but all caged up with a spirit that they can't see. There's no need if you try to point it out to them. It seems like it gets, gets worse and worse. See? There they are, a modern Jezebel, yeah, nice. walking on the streets, and she said, I give you to understand, I belong to this, and I, see, still that, that thing she belongs to has, has cut her off from the resource of life. Amen. Amen. When she was born to be a little queen for some man, or some man that was born to be a, a, a son of God, and to think what has happened to them? Oh, it's a terrible thing. Then, see, God came down, and the character of God was Christ. He, he was a reflection. He was God made visible. Notice, God made visible. In the beginning was God. He wasn't even God then. No, God's an object of worship. only thing he was was the eternal. And in him was attributes, and those attributes were thoughts, and those thoughts was expressed the words, and word was made manifest. What is it? It's all God becoming tangible, and you are a part of God. And Jesus come to redeem those that was put on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. It was in God's thoughts, and that's what he come to redeem. Amen. And them, as soon as it strikes to them, they see it, because the life is in there. But if the life isn't in there, then what can they do? They don't see it. They'll never see it. See, and the whole thing, as Jesus said at that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, Father, me, I, and you, and you, and me. The whole thing is God becoming material, yes. like a husband and wife, becoming one together, God and his church becoming one. Now it taken something to redeem this fallen woman which was typified in Eve. When she fell, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knowed that he was doing wrong. She didn't. That's the reason I'm not hurt your feelings, but you know I've always stood apart. I don't agree with women ministers because it's not supposed to be that way. See, she's the weaker vessel. Now we find that this woman was deceived by um, someone quoting her the word and just missed it a little bit. And that's what caused all the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. The reason Paul said let her keep silent in the church and not permit her to speak, so forth. Now notice, but see, all that is it's displaying showing by type, like the whole Bible, God coming together with a redeemed wife, a bride that God had in his mind before the foundation of the world. That was the attributes of God being displayed. And now to make a character that could redeem this woman, it had to be something greater in her to redeem her. And did you ever notice, I, 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 this may be, now if some of my Armenian brothers are uh, of doctrine, uh, that is, legalists, uh, would disagree. Just let me just, uh, uh, pardon me for a minute, I might project this. If he is the Redeemer, I don't say this to hurt now, it would be different. I don't preach doctrine. But let me ask you something. If he is a Redeemer, he come, a redeem is to pick up that which has fallen. Yes. To redeem back to a place where it was at the beginning. Yes. So none will be picked up but them that was in his thoughts at the beginning. Amen. He Amen. come to redeem, not this cannon fodder that we see around professing to be Christians, but that he came to redeem. Yes. That was in God's thinking at the beginning. Hallelujah. This other is just something that makes around the shoulder statue, see? It just, it's, a, it's a garden, a flower garden. It plays its part. But the statue is what you want to see. The statue of Christ, which was God, projected to the earth in the form of a man. Amen. 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 That's the statue you want to see. Yes. That's the one. This other is just makeup part, you see. Now, this reflected his loving, noble character. 
God reflected in a man called Christ. He was only one that could do this. There was no other character in heaven could do it. See? It was God. He was the sinless nature. He was the Word, sinless nature of God. He was the Word expressed, which the Word was the beginning. And if you are in the Lamb's book of life, you was God's expression from his thought. He's seen you and seen your desire before there even was a, yeah. a Adam or anything else, yeah. and you are his thought made word and expressed in what you are now. Amen. 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 That's God in you reflecting Christ. Amen. Amen. You know what I mean? Uh, I hope that don't interfere with nothing, you see. Now, I wouldn't want to say nothing contrary to what you've been taught, but just so as you to understand what I'm trying to get to here, a reflection. You've got to be identified. And if you are and you were in God's thinking at the beginning, see, and was his reflection here on earth, you'll bear record yes. of the heavenly. And as he bore record of the heavenly also, and when he raised up, from the grave and was given a body, we, when we raise up, will have a body like his own Amen. glorious body. Yes. The resurrection is sure, it's a guarantee, and we have the earnest of it now as the Holy Spirit comes in and identifies us as God's redeemed person. Yes. Amen. Amen. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you're sealed till the journey's over. That is your token that you hold, that shows that your, your fare has been paid. You are a redeemed character. Well, Satan man. has no business with you, none, whatever. Just pick up your token and show him. Amen. My healing is paid for. Amen. My trip to glory, a token is what you use to ride on a bus line or an airplane. Your ticket is your token. See? Take your token. You're redeemed, the blessing, the Holy Spirit. And if Satan tries to push something on you, just show this. Amen. That's your identification. Amen. Hey, man, you are identified in the resurrection of Christ. Amen. You're identified in his death when you die. You're identified in his resurrection. And by that, it identifies you that you were with him before the foundation of the world. Because you are redeemed. That's brought back. All the Father has given me will come, and no man can come unless he, uh, the Father has given it, see, in the beginning. Now, notice, he was sinful, sinless, to take a, a place of the sinful, the antidote. He was without sin, so that he might redeem sinners. God was expressed in him, and properly identified himself in him. Now, notice. You say, Brother Branham, did you say God identified himself? He did. Uh, in the beginning, said St. John 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, a Word has to be a thought before it's a Word, because the Word is the thought expressed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. See? Was God. And the Word, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, identified, how? Now, Hebrews 4, see, the Word of God is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword, cutting asunder, come, go, coming and going, cut asunder, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes. And when he did that, that's how the prophets was identified, because they, God would speak and tell them just what was wrong and what was going on. Amen. See, that is the identification Amen. of the word of the hour yes. being made manifest. Amen. He was the fullness of God's Amen. word. For he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. He was God in human form. Amen. And took God to express such a character as this. And then that lovely life had to be taken from him so that he could say these that God foreknowledge saw in the beginning, which was his thoughts of you and me. 
Jesus came to do that. His perfect life had to be sacrificed to redeem that person. Then, if they do, and you were with God in his thoughts at the beginning, how can you deny his word being true? Yes. When you are part of his Amen. word. Amen. Amen. Certainly. Vindicated properly, they could be no mistake about it. He said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. Now, we find out that in the great turmoil of the day, the people about understanding God, God in three persons, God is three attributes of God, like three offices. God above us in the Holy Spirit up there in a pillar of fire. God made flesh and dwelt among us. A man that we could touch and handle. Now, God in the church. God Amen. above you, God with you, God in you. Amen. See? The same God in three different manifestations, but the same God all the time. Yes. Notice, to be no mistake, his sinless nature expressed God's Word. And the only way that you'll ever be able to express God's Word, that you believe it and watch it act behind you, you'll have to have that sinless nature that come from God before the foundation of the world. You was recognized with Him before the Word could ever express itself through you. It takes the sinless nature to do that. So much so He was the Word in full. The Word of God flowed through Him so freely that even He could speak a word it would create. That showed who He was. Who can create but God? God's the only creator there is. Amen. And he was so perfect in harmony. Him and the Word were so perfectly together until he created. Even he had he and the Word being one. No other nature could do this. No other nature could, no character. Nothing in the heavens, nothing else could do that but him. For he was the beginning of that character. Savior. The angel wasn't born to Savior. He was created a being to worship God. Amen. Not a Savior, but in God was a Savior. Yes. An ordinary man born of an ordinary woman couldn't be a Savior because no. his nature is carnal. But it taken God himself. Right. Amen. Amen. I, I hope you see it. Look, Amen. that was the expression to manifest such a character as that. For others, it was a fallen character. Nothing could save. Angels wasn't created for such. Man was a fallen character. Look, how could this man look? To show it's the ones that he thought of. But his thoughts is the Christian of today. The thoughts before the foundation of the world. Now remember, man, when he was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, comes to the world speaking lies. Yeah. Is that right? right? There's nothing in it at all. Amen. So you see, if he was in God's thoughts, when he come to the world, he's come in God's thoughts at the beginning to display his attribute. You Amen. follow me? Amen. Then Jesus came to break the clouds back so that attribute could display itself. Amen. Amen. He is God expressed word. Now, nothing else could be manifested. Other characters had all fallen. Then you see, what did Jesus come? To bring back those characters? No. No, they were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. He came as a redeemer. And to redeem anything is to bring it back. Yes. Amen. 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 Bring it back. Yes. It was God's thought. You, think, little you, little me. No one in the world could take my place. Nobody can take yours. You being a Christian and filled with the Spirit, God in before the foundation of the world, seeing you and know every feature that you got. See? And Jesus come to bring you back. That's what Jesus was here for. The Redeemer, the human body, to bring you back that had to come to be a human as a Redeemer to display His attributes as Savior come to redeem you and bring you back from where you come from. Amen. You were 
When you receive eternal life, there's only one form of eternal life. That's the Greek word zoe. Is that right, brother? Yeah. Zoe, God's own life. So you being a son, you become part of that life. So the life that's in you never did begin and it never can end. Amen. Right. right. Hallelujah. Think of it. It can't end because anything that's eternal never began. The life that's in you never did begin. Right. That is, if you've got eternal life. And that's God. For you is in his thought on the eternal. And now it's expressed here in a human being for his glory. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Jesus came to redeem that. Being the son, the fullness of God had to come and become that. The sinless character of God did that and he might redeem these other thoughts that succumbed to him to make a life. See what I mean? Oh, it's a glorious story. We ain't ought to get on that anyhow. Let's go on. All right. Notice created. God. God flowed through him just like the, uh, the wind would flow through a, a building or like the uh, uh, water flow down a stream. Even he had uh, him and the word being one. No other character could do it. For he was the only one that was born without carnal, all the rest of them is sexual desire. But carnal, he was born without sex desire. He was a virgin born. God identified himself as we are. He, he took his strain, what he was, his strain is God, and stretched his tent down here and become human. He made himself a tent, a body to live in, and that body is known as Jesus. God lived in Christ. See, he become human in order to save us, and he took our, upon him our form that he might mold in us his character. Yes. And his character was that he did everything that pleased God, and he stayed with the Word. Yes. That's what he molded us for. We'd stay with God's Word. Find our place, and then know where we were at. Stay with his Word. And think of it, we are invited to shape our own character to his. Now, we're going to find out what we've done. Shape our character to his own by his own spirit. Then we by him are sons of God. Just what I've expressed. By having his mind in us to shape our character to his. His mind. Let the mind that was in Christ be in you. If that mind is in you, then you see, he only did that which pleased God. He knowed who he was. He came the Son of God. He knowed he was to take that place. His character had to be that way. And then when he having taken this place, he knew what the Messiah was required of, and he always sought at God to do those things and did nothing until the Father showed him. Now, if you find your place, sister, don't let me hurt you, brother, but you'll find your place in the Word as a Christian. Not what the creed said. That's down here in this lower cannon fodder. It's going to be destroyed. Yes. See, you find your place as a Christian because your character is molded as Christ. Amen. You're Zoe the same as he was Zoe. Then if the Bible said for a woman not to cut her hair, how can you do it? Yes. It said the man's rule of the house, how can you women be? Yes. What's the matter with you, man? The sons of God. See? See, you don't find your place. See? Watch now. In, you're invited to come and take his character. By having his character in you, it molds you into the same mind that he was. And his mind was always to do what the Father had ordained him to do. He said, search the Scripture. They testify me. In other words, if I don't do exactly what the Scripture said I'm to do, then show me where. Now, what if God stood on the platform today and said, what's required of a Christian? Then where would we all be? See? The character isn't expressing itself. His mind was to stay with the Father's Word. Their, their mind, was the same mind was in them, was to be in us, and if his mind is in us, we'll do like he did. If his character is in us, we'll be as he was. Is that right? Yes. All the prophets had that. We know we talk, think about Noah, how he did in his day, Moses, how he did in his day, Daniel in his day, the Hebrew children, and so forth. The Word molds God's character to us, and anything that's tried to be mixed with that character breaks the mold. Yes. You can't mix creed with Word. 
You can't mix the world with the Word. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon means the world. Amen. You can't be one or the other if you love the world or the things of the world. The love of God's not even in you. Amen. Is that true? Amen. Then you see, you can't mix it. You can't mix oil and water. It just won't mix. You can churn it up and down and do anything you want to. It won't mix. And your character will not mix with the world if you are being molded in the form of God by letting the mind that was in Christ be in you. That's the control tower, the direction. Now, let's look into God's mirror, His Word, and identify our present character by some Bible character. And we'll close just in a few minutes now. Identify ourselves. Now, this is a mirror that you want to do like that little boy did, look into. <clears throat> Let's look into this and see if we can see ourselves reflected with some Bible character. See what they did under certain circumstances and see what we are doing now. Now, get me real close now, see. What your present character as a Christian is. Now, you can judge. That won't make nobody judge it. You judge yourself. See? Nobody's judging. I'm not passing judgment. But let's just reflect, see how it reflects from some characters of the Bible, as we mentioned, and see what your character is at this present time. Now notice, uh, the, the Word creates a character, we know that. Now we look into his mirror and identify ourselves by some, some person in the Bible. If you lived in the days of Noah and was in your present character, if you understand me, say amen. amen. If you were living in the days of Noah and in your present character, what side would you have been on? Be careful. See? In your present character, now think of what you are. When the groups, what group would you be identified with? If your present character would have been living in the days of Noah, would you have been with the prophet and God's vindicated words standing in the minority of the little group? Or with the popular opinion folks of that day? Yeah. What uh, character? Would you have been belonging to the churches and things that's making fun of that prophet up there? Uh, would you have been walking up with a group that went up and said, Well, I ain't got nothing against that old man. He might be right. Or would you be in there pitching away with him? Now think of your character now. What would you have done when everything was against it? Remember the world was criticizing the prophet and his message and, and everything. The world was criticized. All the churches was criticizing. All the science said the man's crazy. As it said about Jesus, eating the flesh and drinking his blood. They said the man's a cannibal. He's a vampire. See? So you see where the sensible, what we call the world sensible people, the scientists, did you know when you get more education and more culture, did you know that what side it puts you on? Yeah. It puts you on the devil's side. Yeah. The Bible said that the children of the darkness are wiser than the ones of the light. Yeah. Look at the sons of Cain. Every one of them becomes scientists, dealers in buildings and making great progress. But the sons of Seth was all humble peasant sheep herders. Is that right? Yes. Man renowned of old as it was in the days of Noah. How they built and made and built the pyramids and everything. Scientists. Watch real close now. This people criticized this man's message, so he had the evidence of God with him. Or what if you would have lived in the days of Elijah? Elijah, when him being the pastor at that day, and Jezebel, the 2,500 years ago, Hollywood was starting, with all of her paint and fashions, had got all the daughters of Israel doing the same thing, and one old man stand up there and batter against it. Yes, amen. amen. And all the priests said, oh, well, the old fellow, let him alone, he'll come to his NH while he's nothing to it. And he, our fine king, who's dressed just like we're dressed and got the finest clothes and the best fed nation and everything, what does it make any difference where you do this or that or the other? What difference does it make? 
The pastors have been standing. But there stood one man alone with thus saith the Lord. Amen. Now, in your present character, where would you have been placed then? Now, look in the mirror. When you go home, you see where you're at. What, what state would your present condition now place you at that day? Would you have went with the modern idea, the denomination, the sign, the fellow, oh, well, we're all, may they, oh, sure, they all worship Jehovah every new moon, and they screamed, and they drank the water from the fountain, and praised the God of heaven who brought them up, and all like that, but they're a million miles off the line. Amen. Where would your present Christian experience place you in Elijah's time? Where would you be identified? What side would you have took then? Or when Moses brought Israel, going down there as an identified prophet, with the word that God had promised Abraham the prophet would take place, and Moses went down and done all the signs that God told him to do. Listen close now. We're going to close in a minute. Brought them children out and got into the wilderness. The message, like you Pentecostals, left 50 years ago from the denomination, and they got across the the line over there, and there I raised the man up and said, Now, wait a minute. Let's make an organization out of this. A fellow named Dathan. Moses, you think you're the only one on the beach. You think you're the only holy man among us. We got other holy men. Say something about this. We'll just make us a little group. We'll believe it this way, and we'll believe it this way, and we'll believe it this way. Now, what group would your present character identify you? Amen. Would you, in the days of, of Elijah, would you have went out there where Jezebel, say, cut her hair and painted her face and was a modern woman? Mm. I didn't just think, we, we, where are you identified now? You say, I'm, I'm saying what you are. I'm asking your character. Yes. We're going below these little things that you're looking at. We're going on the inside of you. Did you hear that Holy Spirit last night? I screamed out there at last. That's the reason I'm saying what I am today. Yeah. Open your under, spiritual understanding, people. It's, it's later than you think. Yeah. See? Amen. See? You can, it's, it's a way that a person might think that you're right. But I thought maybe if the Lord would let me speak this, if they'd pardon me for it, uh, the association of uh, uh, the brethren, which I know they do, they're right with me on it. Yeah. Notice. Yeah. But this, if, if you can just see your own self today, in the light, if your spirit that was in you lived in a character back there, yes. now look where you are today and you'll see where you'd have been back there. Amen. Where would you have been in that time? Would you have tough sides with the organization that Dathan wanted to organize? Or would your present character separated you from that Hallelujah. and stayed with the Word? Hallelujah. When it seemed all was against it, Moses had been thoroughly vindicated and he had the message of the Lord. God had proven in every manner just exactly what he said had come to pass. Told Israel, come back in Deuteronomy, way back in there, whatever these signs would be, you must follow that and listen to it and hear what the Word promised. He has made manifest and still Dathan, a smart leader down in Egypt, rose up and said, there you try to make yourself the only one that's got anything. That wasn't Moses' thought. He was only doing what God had ordained him to do. Hallelujah. All of them didn't have to be Moses's. The people only had to follow what he said. Amen. Everyone didn't have to create and do miracles and things. That's what the trouble of people today. Yeah. A lady asked me, coming down the road the other day from up here, she said, this is Florence to Karen, Brother Demas' sister, but Sister Williams and I'm sitting in the car. She said, Brother Bram, I fast and fast and fast and still I can't cast out devils. I said, you wasn't born to do such. Your duty is fast. The Holy Spirit's working on somebody else out there for that. You don't know the place. We had time. We teach those things in long meetings. How, as one person's burden like this for something over here. You don't know. You don't, it's not for you to know. It's him doing it. You're just Amen. submissive to your call. And always line it up with the Scripture. See if it's right or not. Now, we find out. Both, this was uh, Moses, they, he was criticized, and he was, he was uh, 
criticized by this group. But God said to Moses, separate yourself from him, because I'm going to swallow him up in the earth. And he did. Now, you see, you must know the hour that you're living and now judge your character with what they was. Or in the days of Christ, I want to ask you now, when they had the finest seminaries, the finest ministers, the highest educated, the most holy rituals, and everything that we ever, they ever had. And when Jesus come on the scene, he was actually a renegade to them. But you see, God identified his own character in him by manifesting that he was God. Amen. Amen. And he said, if you don't know who I am, search the scripture. Say, we know Moses. We don't. He said, if you'd have known Moses, you'd know me. He wrote of me. Right. Now, if you lived in that day and was a member of some fine church of the Sanhedrin Council, fine pastor, what side would you have took? What, what side would your character now place you on? Think. It's up to you. What side would your, your character now that you are, where would you identify yourself in the days of Jesus? When your pastor said, oh, damn things are nonsense. And yet there comes Jesus back saying, the scripture said I was to do this, and he did it. The scripture said I was to do this, born a virgin. The scripture said I was to do this, and he did it. He said, search the scripture and see where I failed. Yes. But they said, pay no attention to that guy, he's out of his mind. What, uh, what present character do you have? Where would you be placed back there in them days when Jesus was on earth? When the big denominations and theologians was all against him and all the teachers and theologians that day was against him, all the Bible teachers against him? Against what? Against the clear-cut Word of God for that age being made manifest, being identified, God himself identified. His name shall be called Counselor, yes. Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Yes. Amen. A virgin shall conceive, bear this son. The government shall be as over his shoulders. See? Of his kingdom there's no end. Who is this person? A baby God. And then God becomes a man. Could you imagine Jehovah crying like a baby? Could you imagine Jehovah born in a barn? Could you imagine Jehovah playing like a boy? Yes. Could you imagine a church that claimed to worship him crucified? Now, what side would you be identified on? What the true, cut, clean, cut word was saying itself, or would you talk to your creed? Your present character, where would you be at? Now, that's right where you'd been. Whatever you are right now, that's just what you'd been back there. Yes, yes. That's exactly. Amen. Clearly cut. Oh my. When his Messiah sign. Now watch. His Messiah sign identified his character. For it was God in a man, the Word. See what I mean? Yes. It discerned the thoughts and told him all these things. The Word found her in. But when the Word first flashed, she got it. Amen. She was one of those thoughts of God that was manifested. See? But those who stood there in their ecclesiastical robes with all kinds of dignity and all kinds of perverting the Word into different things and making it with no sincerity in it, yes, they belonged to the church. They was the one that claimed to have light, and the light blackened what light they had. Yes, yes. Like you're trying to hold a flashlight the sun. Put the sun out. See? Why won't a flashlight put the sun out? Why won't any other light? There's no light can put the sun out. Why? It's the Word of God made manifest. Amen. God said, let there be light. That's God's light. Amen. It's God's Word manifested. Here he comes. No creed denomination, no pope, priest, or whatever it is, or doctor of divinity, 
no organization, no nation, no nothing will ever put out the manifestation light of God when the word is spoken she comes to the atmosphere to do that what it said it would do no creed can stand around it no nothing can stand around it but light itself and those who will walk in it that's Jesus Christ raised from the dead here manifesting himself among us and we walk in him there's nothing can stop it heavens and earth Jesus said will pass away but it won't notice all the Bible teachers and so forth, yet seeing that word vindicated his Messiah sign, showing that little prostitute who he was, others who was, had them thoughts in God's mind, like, a, a, like a, a Peter and, and a Nathaniel and all those who was in God's thinking, as soon as that light flashed, they recognized it. They didn't have to pull him up the altar, call him up and, and beg him and tell him you do something else for him if they wouldn't. You'd give him a better living and see if you could speak to the boss for a job. Put them in a better a location. They didn't care. They had to fight to hold their place. There's nothing going to separate us in the Bible from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ. Amen. Persecution, peril, death itself can't separate us because we always, always was in his thoughts. All right. On we go. Would your present state identify you with the Pharisees? If that day would your present state. Now, if you should say, no, it wouldn't identify me with them Pharisees then, then what about now? Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, yes. Now, what state does your present character identify you now? Yes. I wouldn't have nothing to do with them Pharisees. No, sir. Now, that's just a name to you. But what about the estate that you're in? Yes. When you see him today in his church, just as he was then. Now, where would you be? History is repeating itself. Pharisees of that day stood against him because of prejudice. And that's what's the matter today. The denominational world stands against truth of the word because it's prejudice. Being interviewed by a Catholic priest not long ago, he said to me, you're trying to teach a Bible. I said, that's what I believe in. He said, God's in his church. I said, God's in his word. Amen. He said, that was all them early people were Catholics. I said, uh, Peter, James, and John, they were all Catholic. I said, if they were, and he said, I said, you, what do you think about the church? They said, it's far better off it was then. I said, do the things you did then. Yeah. Amen. See, the character shows exactly what it is. Pharisees of that day for prejudice. Remember, it was prejudice. They actually seen it. Nicodemus, one of their priests, expressed it. He said, Rabbi, we know your teacher comes from God. No man could do what you do without God being with him. See? But for prejudice, because he didn't join up with their group. If he comes and say, now you Pharisees are wrong. I am a, I'm a Sadducee. Or you said, you see, he's wrong, I'm Pharisee. Pharisee said, see, I told you we were right. But he didn't come to any of them. But he stood between them. Amen. If you would have followed him to see his miracles then, and then it, and you say, oh, I'd love to see his miracles. And you followed him to see his miracles. And then when he comes to this place that he stopped displaying his miracles like and began to teach them. And the 70 ministers ordained by Christ got up and walked away from him because he said something that science couldn't go with or the rest of the crowd couldn't go with. They couldn't understand how that man being a man yet make himself God coming down from heaven. The son of man ascended up where he come from. He was God. Sure he was. They said, oh, we, that's too hard. We can't go that. Where would you be identified at that time? Now with your character. It's molded in you. Something's molded your character. You're some kind of a character. You're going to find yourself somewhere here. What would you have done? What in your present state now? What where would you've been at that time? See, teachers all against him and everything, and his miracles identified him. And when the seventy got up and the pastors and the ministers and the, uh, got up and said, "We can't understand that," would you have walked away like that congregation? 
Or would you have been like them disciples? I don't care what they say. It's there. Then Jesus turned to give them trial and said, You all want to go too? See, they had him caught in a trap. Why, this man's a vampire. Said they have to eat his flesh and blood. They walked away, the congregation. Well, the minister says, Well, we'll stay a little while longer, see what it's all about. And he said, Now, when you see the Son of Man identifying himself as God now, see, when you see the Son of Man lifting up into heaven from where he come from, oh, they said, This is too much for us. And off they went. Then he turned to the disciples and said, You want to go too? And Peter said, Lord, who would we go? Where could we go? We know that you and you alone has the words of life. And that's the same thing today. He, not your organization, not your group, Christ and him alone has the word of life. Where do you identify yourself? With some false fable of something man has made up? Or the achievement of God, as I spoke last Sunday on the countdown, what God's been able to achieve to get his church into astronaut age now. Or where would you or can you see your own identification now? Notice, with the uh, popular loving teacher, I want to speak to you young folks just a minute. Where do you identify yourself, young lady? You at school? Oh, you can split grains, you can show all this, and you're your science teacher and everything. But do you know what? They can't give you life. Life only comes by Christ. Amen. To know Him, not know His Word, not know His church, not know His this, know Him. That's the only thing that can give you life. And now, when this come before a modern teenager, something like a modern Pentecostal boy, Elvis Presley, who sold his birthrights for fleets of Cadillacs and a million dollars of gold records and so forth. That's what the world wants. They want a Pentecostal. Uh, the, the people, they, the women want a Pentecostal. Let, let them cut their hair and wear shorts or do anything you want to and, and just maintain their, their, their testimony to be a Pentecost. Amen. They, they want that just the same. See, no, I wouldn't go to that bunch. No, they go, that's old fashioned. Yeah. See, they want that. It's just the nature. And some of the man that's led by the women gives it to them. Yeah. But God is able to be stones. Hallelujah. Somebody's got to scatter the light. Yes. And we've got man today who's not afraid to scatter, too. Right. Let it be whatever it wants to. Where are you identified? What group are you with? Yes. See? Where do you stand? Notice, this young fellow, he identified himself with his own church. The price is too great. So if, so if you remember his last identification where we identified this young ruler that had the opportunity to come follow Jesus. He went ahead and took his church and went on. He's a good boy. He said he kept the commandments and done all these things. And he was just as good as any of the rest of them. So he just take that idea. He rejected to follow Jesus. In his last identification, we find him in hell, crying for Lazarus to come bring him some water. Or your identification, could you be identified with the group that Judas was in? He started to walk with Jesus. He started out all right, like the Pentecostals did years ago. But the very thing that they come out of, the organization, your mothers and fathers, this young group has turned right back and made them one just like they come out of. Yes. Hmm? What type of a group are you with? Now, the Bible said this lady will see a church age. Judas no cared. The, he saw the possibilities of getting something great with what he had. He was identified with Jesus. So he thought for that he carried the bag and he could make some extra money but sell them for 30 pieces of silver. That's exactly what the lady of Sia church age did. The Bible said so. You're rich and you say I've increased and I have plenty of goods and I have need of nothing and you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, blind, naked and don't know it. That's Pentecostal, the last church age. Not Luther, not Wesley, but Pentecostal. That's the church age. Where are you identified now? Say, I'm Pentecostal. You see where it's identified? Of putting him on the outside. Right. Certainly. Because they're rich. Have need. Oh, you say rich. Why, well, you used to stand out here and pay $3 a week for a little shanty on the corner. Now, I'm trying to identify that. But if it takes that to preach the full words, take that. Yes. Amen. Certainly. Now we're paying $50 million for seminaries and 
groups and great big things and uh, other places putting billions and millions of dollars in great big buildings to make way and preaching that Jesus is coming soon. Yes. And missionaries I know on the field with no shoes on their feet. Right. 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 Amen. Making up an offering for some more missionaries than one old brother with nothing on his feet but a pair of sandals. That's all he had. He picked them up and laid them up there for an offering for some other missionaries. Oh, Where are you, Brother? Pentecostal. I won't stay too long there, but you know what I mean. Oh, my. Sold out. Sold out what? Sold out our birthright for popularity. We wanted to be like the Methodists. You want to be like the Baptists and the Presbyterians. That's the kind of village you got. You put up a seminary and a, like an incubator and hatch you out some preachers that'll let you do anything you want to and still call yourself Pentecost. Amen. It's a lie. Amen. Right? Amen. 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 Remember, remember, that was the very thing that turned Judas to be popular amongst the rest of the ministers. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He, what made him turn? He actually doubted the claims of Christ being the Word. He could see that man eat with him, fish with him out there and everything else, and him being the Word, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe he was God, but he was. Amen. Judah's character caused him to do this. Has your character done the same? Remember, Judas is very religious. I went to Africa and they said, why, Elvis Presley, we got his songs all over here, he sings. Pat Boone and them, they ought to be permitted to speak the name. Filth and dirt, it's hypocritical. Yes. He that names the name of Christ, let him separate himself from sin. Amen. Amen. Well, there you are. See where we got to? Sin is so treacherous, it moves in so cunning, you don't know it's there. Just done got you wrapped around it, see? And then it's got you in its clutches. See what? Judas' final identification was, and my brother, because the church that you go to is bigger than the next one over on the corner, yet they're preaching the truth and you're not, you see where that gets you? That's the Judas spirit. Amen. And you know his last identification was hanging on a sycamore tree. Or do you find yourself identified with the real disciples of Christ? Now we're going to close sure enough now. True to him and his word in the face of all criticism? Can you identify yourself with Peter on the day of Pentecost? Man. When all of them stood up and said, look at this bunch of crazy people. They're all drunk. Peter stood up and said, ye men of Jerusalem and you that dwell in Judea, let this be known to you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk as you suppose. This is just the third hour of the day, but this is that, the scripture that was spoke of by the prophet Joel. Amen. What was it? The word of God was being manifested. Amen. He said, repeat every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Amen. promises unto you and your children in them is plural. Amen. How many? Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. He never called all, you know. Amen. But them that Paul know what to do. Yes. All right. Or with Paul. Or when we use with Paul, when the, the, the popular loving Demas forsaken him for the things of the world, his helpmate. If you've seen all the people laughing at Paul, here Paul said, bring a coat. A man with a ministry like he had only had one coat. Well, Demas thought he ought to have a great big Bible school and all this organized everywhere and some great association where he could heal the sick. He's a prophet. Well, he ought to have all kinds of money, millions of air. And here the man only had one coat. So it's getting cold down here. Tell him to bring my coat down when he comes. And Demas, seeing this, went with the world and left his poor little brother to fight it alone. Would you dare to stand and see Jesus out there cold, to see him needy, and you walk away from him? Remember St. Martin? Many of your brothers remember him. The writings of St. Martin. He was in Taurus, France. He wasn't a Christian. His mother was a Christian. He was a cousin to, to um, uh, Irene. And then this is several hundred years after the death of the apostles, when they're still trying to keep the word together. And the Catholic Church is taking it all off on dogmas and they wouldn't stand for it. And St. Martin going through a gate where a cold afternoon and there laid a poor old beggar laying there freezing to death. Nobody would give him a coat. St. Martin took off his own coat, 
cut it in half and wrapped the beggar in it and went on. They laughed at him. What a silly soldier that is. He's even breaking the rules of our army. He's doing all of this. A oh, man with a half coat wrapped around him for that bum. That night as he laid in his bed, he was awakened by a noise. And when he looked up, there stood Jesus wrapped in that piece of coat. He knowed what he'd done to that beggar, he'd done to Christ. And that was his conversion. Would you stand and see the gospel suffering today? Or would you go with a popular loving crowd like Demas did? Or are you going to stand by him? Live or die. Like Peter did. I'm ready to go to prison or wherever with him. Yeah. When the issue comes forth in the church, whether women should cut their hair or what they should do like it did in Corinthians, what side do you take then? What's your present state do that time? Think of it, sister. Amen. When Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or serve any authority, but be under obedience, they wrote and told him, said, Well, the church over here, the Holy Ghost told us. He said, What? Came the word of God out of you and came it from you only. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet, let him acknowledge what I say is the commandments of God. Amen. He said in Galatians 1 8, If an angel comes from heaven and says any other thing, let him be accursed. Amen. What side would you take in that issue if it's in your church? Hmm? Fine, your present state now. I'm just trying to ask where you're at. Oh, brother, let's hurry. Paul stooped from a great position. You remember? You say, but brother, I, I'm a district man. I'm a, I'm a, I don't care what you are. I'm asking you what's your present position, your present character. Well, what, what's it doing for you? Where would you be identified? Paul, remember, come down from a great education under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was his great teacher. And he was a great something, would have been a great man. But he stooped to see that the Word of God could continually grow. Yeah. He gave his life. Yeah. Moses, come from a throne to be a Pharaoh. To carry the word of God through the wilderness. Jesus come from heaven. Amen. Amen. To give you life. What crowd are you identified with? Oh, to make a way to reflect itself like a flashing light. What will you do that for now? Right? Just sit still just a minute long. Feel a minute long. If you all be grateful. I know I'm holding you long. It's right now 20 minutes to five. We'll be gone by five, the Lord willing. What crowd would you be identified with? I want to ask you something. Jesus come that he might turn on the light. The flashlight takes a picture. See? That he could, you could be reflected or he could be reflected in you. When your picture is taken, it looks like his. When people look at you, they see God's Word living again. That's what he comes to bring that camera. By sanctifying blood to bring the Word close to you. For this cause, he said, John 14, 12, the works that I do shall you do also. And if any will follow me, let him deny his creed, deny himself, deny the world, take up his cross and follow me. Or are you found identified in some of the scriptures where the, uh, in some of the scriptures where the them that didn't stay, where are you identified with anyhow? The camera has already flashed. You're identified somewhere. Yes. You're Amen. sitting here this afternoon, every one of us. Now listen. You're identified somewhere. The camera's already flashed. You know what you are. Yes. It's stuck your picture somewhere. Now where are you standing? You're the judge. God help us to be so identified in him that we'll reflect his life in our own. Listen. The goldsmith used to take and beat the gold. And he kept beating it and beating it and turning it over and beating it until he sees his own reflection in it. Then it was pure gold. All the sludge is beat out. May the Holy Ghost today and in this meeting in the hours to come, may he take this word and beat it over in our heart until all of the doubts, all the creeds, and all the things contrary to God is gone. That we can, re listen now, that we... The church can reflect his resurrection. Amen. Listen, this little story. And then get your prayer cards ready. In Carlsbad, New Mexico, many of you heard of that big cavern down there. Down under the ground. You go down about a mile on a, on a thing, it goes plumb all the way down a mile under the ground. It's so dark. Until you put your hand like this, you couldn't see nothing. It's just so dark. And a little family went out one time, and, and uh, the little boy was walking with the guide, and the guide went over all at once and just 
flip the light. And the little girl began to scream. She was scared. That's about like the little bride now that has to take her stand. It looks dark. The council of churches is going to throw you into that thing or you're going to have to take a stand and come out. Amen. You have to reflect your character. Amen. What's she going to do in that time? What's going to happen when he can't bind herself? When they have a union of church. Now you say, when that happens, no, no. The flash is done, took your picture then. Your character's already told you, you're already in it. You know what the Bible said about that. They would come and say, yes, Lord, we're coming in now, but it's too late, the door's closed. What's going to happen to the little bride? I think of it in this little story. You know, when that little girl was screaming and jumping up and down in hysteria, she like scared her to death when she seen what happened. And that midnight darkness just cut off all at once. The little boy said, screamed out with all of his voice, said, Don't fear, little sister. We got a man here who can turn on the lights. Amen. Don't you fear, little sister. We got a man here who can turn on the lights, who, who can make the Word of God do just what it's supposed to do. Amen. That man is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let your character reflect with his. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Amen. Don't fear, little sister. We got a man here who can turn on the light. Wherever you are, whatever you have seen your place this afternoon, I leave that with you. Your present character will make you see yourself somewhere along the line, which we could have went hours and hours on. What is your present character? Now, let's pray, and you pray too. Now, remember, I may never see you again. You may never see me again until we meet over there. Now, in your present state, I don't care who you are, in your present state, I'm putting myself in there too. What does my character reflect this afternoon? Where am I identified? Heavenly Father, search our, search our hearts in this minute. It only takes a moment of time, a change. Let the mind of Christ come into us. The Bible said, let the mind that was in Christ be in you. That changes our character. And in this drawn out sermon, if I should call it that this afternoon, just my humble way of showing the people what I believe that you would have us to know. God, let the mind that was in Christ be in me. And if any word that I fail to punctuate your word with an amen, and then follow it out, then Lord, change me, make me over. I'm your servant. I want to be, Lord. Help thou me. Help everyone in here, Lord. And now I commit them to you. If there is those here, Lord, who is in your thinking before the foundation of the world, surely this is waking them up. I trust that every one of them, Lord. And there, Father, we'll know when you come and the great book is open, we will understand them. And if there's some that has strayed away, got off the path, I pray, God, that today you'll bring them back. Bring them back to that path of righteousness and life. We're in your hands, Lord. Do with us as you see fit. I give this audience to you as trophies of the meeting. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, we haven't time for the altar call, but I want the altar call to be in your heart. Where are you identified in your present state? Now, at your preaching like that, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, if you will, to help me just a minute now so I can get the anointing uh, to pray for the sick. These things that I have said, let them be true, God, which they are true. Now, if everyone will just keep your seat and be real reverent just a moment, please. So, you see, in contacting, you're right on something here and something moves, throws you out. It's a very hard thing. It looks like if that one woman up there at... Um, the Sychar. It was done one time. Jesus didn't repeat it over and over, but the American people's got to be entertained, you know. That, that's just the nature of us. We just, we'd rather stay home and watch television, more entertainment than it is in the church, see. That's, see, that's entertainment. That's what we want. It's got into the church. God don't entertain you. He just brings you his word. Amen. 
He said that to that woman, and they had to believe that prostitute's word for it, but the whole city was ready. See? They were in the thoughts of God before the foundation of the world. Now, may God repeat it again this afternoon. It's my humble prayer in leaving you. May he leave this with you. Pray. How many out there, I don't see a person there that I know, all that's in this crowd, and I don't believe you probably prayer cards is all over the place. But you sitting out there that's sick or got a need or something, and you know that I know nothing about you, raise up your hand. It's just everywhere you're on. See? It's just everywhere. May the Lord help us now. And just, uh, don't, no one move. Don't, please, no one move. This is a, a great thing. Now, you know what he'd be saying, trying to explain it, there's no way of doing it. Now, the Bible said, which is the word, that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Now, sometimes faith is unknown to you. You got it, and you don't know it. You try to push yourself into something, you miss it. You go over the top of it. It's a humble, simple. Yeah. And he is a high priest that can be touched by our infirmities. Then if you touched him, he'd act like he did before. Is that right? Now watch. You see this woman sitting right down here? I don't know the little soul. She's just sitting there, but somehow she's in contact with God. Because in the dimension that I'm now looking in, I see the woman. And she's conscious that something's going on. She's praying for her children who's not here. That is right. I don't know her. I've never seen the woman, but she was deeply concerned about some children. Do you believe me to be his servant? Do you believe that, that Jesus Christ is here, the Holy Spirit, who, you see, if we can get ourselves out of the way, see, not to heal you, I can. See? Or to give you your desire, I can. See, that has to come through God, unless he tell me to tell you something. Now, but if he can reveal to me what the matter with that child or whatever it is, you, you will believe me to be his servant? You will. Now, the whole audience, if you wish, the ladies sitting right there, would you stand up? Now, the Bible ain't here before me. I do not know the woman. I've never seen her. I hear her. Come right back to Sychar now. Please, everyone, be reverent. See, when you see something, see, it's a spirit, it moves, it throws me off of you. Yes, the lady has three children she's praying for, and all three of them is shattered. That is, they are not Christian, they're unsaved. That is right. One of them is a girl, and she has a sore on her leg up high. That's right, isn't it? One, something wrong with their eyes, one of the boys. Another's got heart trouble. And there's an alcoholic. That's true. Is that your desire? Is that what you want from God? Then I ask in Jesus' name that he gives you what's your desire. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You need anything else? Hallelujah. Here's a lady, just as I said that, it disturbed her. She's sitting right back here. She's suffering with arthritis. Her name is Miss Thomason, if she won't know. Yeah. I am a stranger to you. i never seen you in my life, but that's who you are. Do you believe me to be a servant, lady? Do you believe what I've said is true and comes from God? You're suffering with arthritis. That's your husband sitting there by you. He's suffering too. He has something wrong in his, his veins. It's called hardening of the artery. That's right. And he has something wrong with his feet also. That is right. And then you're trying to quit drinking. You want to do it. You're an alcoholic. But you're trying to quit drinking. You believe me to be his servant? Will you accept me as God's servant? Then I deliver you from that. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now you believe, sir. You give your heart to Christ. See the ministers about baptism and the things over for you. You just believe. You believe? Yes. If thou canst believe. Got something wrong with your side, have you, honey? If you believe with all your heart, God will heal it. 
sitting there next to you got diabetes. Do you believe that God will heal the diabetes for you and make you well? Heart trouble. Do you believe God will heal the heart trouble? Also, heart trouble next. Do you believe God will heal the heart trouble next? That's right. Do you believe he'll do that? This big lady sitting here a few minutes ago, when I was preaching, come down about identifying yourself, she looked right straight towards me. You were healed, man. You had kidney trouble. Lord. That's right. Stand up on your feet. Hey. Well, you remember, wasn't a strange feeling come to you and I said that about identifying yourself, and you had a real strange feeling, look right straight to me. That's when it took place. Go home now, you're away. Just believe God. That's all. See? The Word is made manifest. Caught your breath, sir. You believe God can heal you that heart trouble, make you well? The man with the gray hair, nice looking fellow sitting here. You believe God will heal the heart trouble? You do. Your wife sits there now. You believe I can tell you what's wrong with your wife by the help of God? You believe that God can tell me what's wrong with her? It's anemia, a blood condition. That's right. You believe God will make you both well now? You do? You accept it? Now the lady sitting next to her, see that going down there? That lady has something wrong with her back. You believe God will heal the back trouble, lady, and make you well? The man next to you has arthritis. You believe God will heal you the arthritis, sir? You accept it? You do? Got your hand up? All right. How about the little lady sitting there looking right at you, right next to you? Yes, she prayed for her mother. Mother in a hospital with infection. That's right. You put up your hand right next to your sister. It wasn't a mother you were praying for. This lady's praying for her mother in a hospital. But you, your daddy's got cancer you're praying for. And that's right. The next lady has lung trouble. You believe God will heal the lung trouble? Uh, now, I see, it's just got this, um, it's blinded almost. See, about 20 or 30 people across there. Huh? Where are you identified now? Amen. Are you identified as saying, I am a believer, I believe God, or I believe that this is Him? Do you identify, or you can be identified with that word and say, God promised that what Jesus did then, He did again today, and I believe that we're living in the days of Sodom, and just before the destruction of the world, and Jesus promised that He had manifest Himself again, just like He did at Sodom, like He was doing there, and like He's doing now. Do you believe it? Then all you that have prayer cards in this one row here, this section here, Stand up against the wall that way. Go right out of your place. Stand up against the wall. All on this side. Now, let those that are in this section that have prayer cards, the middle section, stand up in this aisle. Stand out this way. Don't, don't move over now. Stand right now. Go right. Now, wait. I want this, this crowd over on this side to stand this way. Look, turn this way. I want this crowd to go around this way. Go back through the aisle. Go back that way. Come around and join yourself over here. Now, all that's in this other section that has prayer cards, stand up in this aisle this way. That's right. Come out here. You go back towards the back and join in behind me. Now, you're either going to see a complete flop or you're going to see the glory of God. Now, where are you identified today with believers? Or you have to be entertained, or, or you're going to believe God. Some of them in the Bible time, as even the shadow of St. Peter, a fisherman who couldn't sign his name, the shadow of that man that showed the same sign that you see here today, passed over the people and they were healed. How many knows that's true? Right. Now, Amen. brother, you're not left out. If there be a pastor here that believes in praying for the sick, I don't want to leave you people think me stand up here as an evangelist and, and with a gift of discernment and so forth like that and the prophetic hour that we're living in to make you think that your pastor just ain't just as much as anybody else. He's a servant of Christ with the same authority that I have or anybody else has. Our authority is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to have them come down here and pray with me while we're praying. Um, every pastor in here that believes in divine healing and wants to stand with us here, would you come and take your stand with me here while I'm praying for the sick? Any of you pastors that wants to come, this group of pastors, sponsoring pastors, I ask the mayor, it makes no difference what the pastor is, what church he belongs to. If you're Presbyterian, Lutheran, or Catholic priest, 
come here and stand with us if you believe the message of Christ. That you believe in divine healing, come here and lay your hands upon. Surely you wouldn't you wouldn't separate as a servant of Christ. You wouldn't separate yourself from your from the human beings, no matter whether they belong to your 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 manse or not, or your parish. You wouldn't separate yourself from them. You'll believe. Now you're welcome to come here and help with me laying hands upon these sick people that they might be healed. All right, I think the lines are about ready to start. I want the ushers now to get their places so they can help with the people. Now, so that we we'll, everybody will understand. Now, listen real close. Can you hear? Say amen. Say it again. Look, I'm going to give you a... Uh, I can't take each person, stand there and pray with them and have the sermon. I'd go about five or six more and they'd be taking me away to the building. You know that. Jesus, a woman touched him and he turned around and told her what her trouble was and all about and he said, virtue's gone out of me, strength. One person, and that was God, manifested his flesh. This is just a little gift to manifest him. A promised gift for the day. Notice, friends, Peter one time was called on the scene where there's a woman dead by the name of Dorothy. All of you remember, say amen. amen. And he went over and knelt down and prayed. After, listen now, you people in the prayer line. After he prayed, he went over and laid hands on Dorcas and she came to life. Is that right? Amen. Now, brethren, I want you and this congregation to join in with me. Look here, stand here, about 500 people or maybe more standing here this afternoon to be prayed for. Now, let us pray a prayer of faith, each one of us. And then when the people come by, when you lay your hands up on them, lay them up on there with faith that it's going to happen. Amen. I'm going to believe. I'm, I, with all my heart, I'm going to believe. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, Amen. now the great march will start through here. Hundreds of people will pass through and under these ministers' hands. Let them realize, Lord, that they're just passing under the cross. They're passing under the where the blood was shed to make this what we're doing to be real. Amen. For he that hung on the cross said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Amen. And let the people accept it. You promised you would save whosoever will. You can't save the world because whosoever will won't believe you. You went into a city, many, many works you couldn't do because of unbelief. Neither will you be able to help one person that comes through this line unless they're willingly from the bottom of their heart to identify themselves with the believers and the word of God that the thing's over. May this great identification come now. That when each of these people passes under the hands of these ministers, may the Holy Spirit place into their heart that they have did the bidding of God. And may they go out of here rejoicing, healed for the kingdom of God's sake. We obey you, Lord, in this act, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want someone, Roy, come here if you will, and saying, only believe, I want to rest there with your head bowed and everybody praying. Now, these are mothers, fathers, and children, little sick babies, people dying with cancer. If it was you, you want somebody sincerely. And we want that sincerely. Now, let's all bow our heads now. I'm going to step down here among my brethren to pray for the sick. You know, it's been a most wonderful time in this fellowship. And I noticed something this afternoon. I don't know whether you did or not. Ninety percent of those people that were healed were healed before they even got to where I was at. Praise the Lord. They were screaming and shouting and giving God praise before they got there. Now we're going to pray for these handkerchiefs. Lord Jesus, we know that in the Bible they said they took from the body of St. Paul. Not because he was Paul, but because that he was your servant, Lord. He was your ambassador. And we know that they say that sickness and diseases departed. Many people could not attend the meeting, and they sent a handkerchief to represent them. God, let the angel of the Lord 
He was the one that looked down upon the Red Sea and he got it scared. And Israel went on to their promise. Grant it, Lord, that this will be the same. May these anxious laying upon the sick heal the sick for the kingdom of God's sake. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. Now, I just want to say a word or two to you because I really appreciate you. I appreciate these fine ministers all down in the line. They put in their time to help and everything. Maybe you might have thought, brother, that while the discernment was going on and so forth down here, I didn't know what you were praying about. But the Lord Jesus reminded me of it. I know what. Don't worry about your mama. <laughs> She'll be all right. And you sitting there, let's sign us some female trouble. I know it all along. You're going to be over it. Don't worry. See, it was behind us. Seems like you're in front of us. He knows all about it. See, now you've come through the prayer line with the same God that would anoint you before the service. Here he is doing the same thing. Just the, and he's just the same yesterday and ever. Do you believe him? Oh, isn't he wonderful? Isn't this something? Yeah, how many knows this song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love? Could you give us a key on that, sister? I don't, I don't want to sing it. I don't know why. But let's just sing it. Sing real reverent before we now. And sing, sing it together now. Blessed be the tie that Again, God be with you. Pray for me. I love you. Amen.